What comes to your mind when you hear the term microservices? Perhaps being able to move away from a monolith, developing and deploying individual services. All of that's great. But what about testing a microservice? Are we looking at testing the services together like a monolith? No, we don't want to do that. So are we looking at end-to-end -end testing? Important but complex. Could we opt for a golden mean here? I mean, we'd love to, but is there one? And what are its disadvantages? All of these are good questions, but I cannot answer them for you. But the good part is that our speaker, Holy Cummins, senior principal engineer with Red Hat and a fellow Java champion has all these answers for you. Hi everyone, thanks for joining in for another IntelliJ Idea live stream. I'm your host, Mala Gupta, and we have our speaker with us today. Hi, Holi. How are you? Hi, Mala. Very well. And it's a pleasure to have you present with us today. I, I so look forward to learning from you today. Oh, thank you so much for inviting me. And so we have been hosting a lot of uh, sessions on testing on IntelliJ ID Livestream. We had Oleg talking about test containers. We had Rudy talking about integration testing. So, um, and today you are talking about uh, packed contract testing. So I have a quick question for you. Does every organization need contract testing? I don't think so. No, I've, I've been talking about contract testing for a while. And, and the reason I'm a big fan of contract testing is I was on a project where we had quite serious problems with our microservices testing and then contract testing just sorted a lot of them out. But when I, mm -hmm. when I speak about contract testing, sometimes people come up to me afterwards and they say, this is amazing. I didn't know about these tools and I can see they're really going to solve my problems. And sometimes people come up to me and say, you know what, actually, I just don't recognize the problems that you're describing. The, you know, we have some testing challenges, but they're, they're not going to be solved by this because we've got different, you know, <laughs> we've got different fish to fry. And so I think like everything, you really kind of need to look at your circumstances and your organization and the, the shape of your technology and, and the shape of your organization and then figure out whether it makes sense or not before sort of rushing in to adopt a new technology. Right, right. Makes sense. Because yes, you need to, anyone who wants to try this out, need to identify with the scenarios and see if that's a good fit or not. That, that totally makes sense. So I, uh, before I let you take the stage, let me share some quick housekeeping details. Everyone who is watching this live stream today, please use YouTube chat to post your questions. I and Yuri from IntelliJ Idealize, uh, team would answer your questions as you pose them. So you don't have to wait till the end of the session. Also, Holi will take break to answer your questions. And one of the most asked questions, this session is being recorded and will be hosted on IntelliJ Ideas YouTube channel. So if you haven't already subscribed to our channel, now is the time to do so. And if you like today's session, which I'm sure you would, um, like the video, so and also keep an eye on future live streams that we host so that you do not miss amazing content. So um, I will add Holy's stream content to the streams. I'm miss missing the terms today, so sorry. <laughs> so <laughs> words are hard. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so uh, the stage is all yours and have fun. Thank, thanks so much. Um, so I think Mala, can you see? pink sheep um yes i can yeah yes <laughs> that's one of those questions you want to be a little <laughs> bit careful about answering <laughs> but <laughs> you're supposed to see pink sheep so it's so it's, so it's all yes, good it, um yeah. so i've got some sort of slides to to set the stage a little bit about what kind of problems this is solving and then also uh introduce some of the concepts because they can be a little bit tricky to to wrap your head around and then i'll go to a demo which is of course the most exciting part so I think as, as our industry has moved towards microservices, one of the questions that I think is still really unanswered is how do I, if I'm developing just one part of the system, if I'm working on just a single system, how does my organization know the whole system works without getting bogged down into 
doing really large scale end to end testing, because if you're doing that, then you're starting to lose a lot of the, the goodness of microservices. You're starting to lose that promise of a team can work independently and autonomously and ship stuff without either being dependent on the rest of the organization or completely breaking the rest of the organization, because that would be bad. And I think one of the real promises of microservices, one of the things that we're really drawn to when we go towards a microservices architecture is this idea that teams can deploy independently, that services can be deployed independently. And the Dave Farley, he has this really nice rule of thumb when he goes into a client to try and see how well they're achieving this goal. And all he does is he just looks at the versions of of the services that are deployed. And if he sees that every single one has the same version, then that tells them that they're being deployed in lockstep, that they're, we're not getting this independent deployment. And instead, what what would be a more, much more healthy scenario is something like this, where you see different numbers and some services are hardly changing at all, but then some services are able to evolve really rapidly and they are being deployed independently. But the thing that often stops that is that organizations don't have the confidence to deploy independently. And the reason they don't have the confidence to deploy independently is because they don't really have confidence that the system works without testing the whole system together, which is what we're trying to avoid. And, and often this desire to test everything together and to release it all at the same time gets completely baked into the pipelines. So instead of having individual pipelines for our CI CD, which is what, if we're living the microservices dream, we should be doing, instead we have one huge pipeline to make sure that it is completely physically impossible to deploy the microservices individually, which is a bit sad. So, and, the, and again, the, you know, the reason this happens is because the organization is too dependent on end-to-end -end testing and there's just no confidence without those end-to-end -end tests. And, you know, if I'm honest, there's really good reasons for this. Testing microservices in isolation, it's probably not going to be enough to give the right level of confidence that you could deploy to production without disasters. And, and this is because although the, the promise of microservices is that all, each service is decoupled, in practice, that's, that's not guaranteed. And just because you distribute the system does not mean they're decoupled. I sometimes think, you know, they, they both start with D, so we assume that if we're distributed, we're decoupled, but it, it just doesn't follow, you know, the, they, are, they are different things. And... And we talked at the beginning about whether every organization needs microservices. And I mentioned that I was, or every organization needs contract tests. And I mentioned I was introduced to them on a, on a troubled project. So I was a, a consultant and I flew into this project and I got off the plane. And pretty much the first thing they said to me was every time we touch one microservice, all the others break. And I thought, mm, yeah, I'm fairly sure <laughs> in the microservices manual, that's not how it's supposed to work. And, and in this, in this case, the, what was happening was that the mocks, the isolated testing just was not enough to catch the integration problems between these services. And I think this is really fundamental to the nature of mocks or test doubles or, or whatever you want to call them. So if you, if you start out to write a mock, what happens is you have a conversation with the other team and we, they say, okay, our code looks like this. This is the interface for our code. Here's our API. And we go, great, understood. I'm going to implement a mock that looks like what you told me your service looks like. The problem happens when things go wrong. So if I have that mock, I can write my tests. It's all good. But what if what if their code is actually different from what they said, either because they I misunderstood or because they something was subtly wrong in their implementation? Then in that case, my tests are going to pass fine, but when I deploy to production, it's going to be broken. And this is something that we see all the time. It's it's it can happen 
even with really little misunderstandings. So I'm just going to switch to the demo now and I'm going to show one example of how this can happen. So I've got a little demo application here and you can see at the moment there is no demo application um, because I haven't started it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my terminal and I'm going to start my application. Um, so I, I work for Red Hat. I'm an engineer helping to build Quarkus. Um, a lot of the experiences about contract testing that I had were from a previous role where I was a consultant. Um, but now I, I work on Quarkus, so I'm going to use Quarkus for my demo, of course. Um, so I'm going to start my application and I'm going to start the, the first service. So I have a, a, a retail application. So the model is that I've got um, here, what I've got is I've got a Quarkus application and it's using some, something called Quinoa, which is a Quarkus extension that allows you to combine some um, a JavaScript application like React or Web Components or something like that. And it, it just takes care of all of the stitching those two applications together. And so it, it forwards ports and that kind of thing. Um, so now that I've started my application, if I go back to my web browser, I should have an application. But because this is a live demo, <laughs> Let's try that again. Right. So I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how much I love live demos because this is failing completely out of the blocks. So let's have a look and let's just try that again. See if something's squatting on a port. Nope. Okay, let's try that again. I will pay a bit more attention to what was in the log this time. So we've got our application starting. And you can see that the JavaScript part is listening on 3000. You can see it's run the tests. And then somewhere up here, we should have it saying it's listening on 8080, which it has not done yet. So let's go back here. And that is incredibly, incredibly sad. So what I'm going to do. Oh, OK. I have to mute, unmute myself. Now, oh. uh, is it about the port on, your, uh, on which you're listening? Probably yeah, three thousand. Well, no. So it it, it should be eighty eighty. Um, so what what what's happening here with um with quinoa is we have the Node.js application that's listening on port three thousand. Oh, there we go. It was just being incredibly slow. Okay. okay. I have no idea. <laughs> Let's try that again. So yeah. So what what it does is because normally when you have that kind of application where you've got a Java backend and a, a, f a web front end, then you either have to listen on, you have to visit 3000 and it will for forward to the Java application or it will listen on the 8080 and it will forward to 3000. So that was just being glacially slow for some reason. I have no idea why. Yeah, we'll just, we'll ignore that. And we'll go to 8080. Hooray. Okay. So that, that wasn't the point of the demo. The point of the point of the demo was not supposed to be Ken Holly successfully start a Quarkus app, <laughs> but we, we go I, over that. I, <laughs> so I, I that yeah. ends well. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I said all's well that ends well. So yeah. you're all good. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's the nature of live demos. You know, you sort of practice all the hard bits and then it happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Right. So now I have my, I have my application up and I'm going to order my sweater. So I would like to order a nice white sweater and then the next part of my demo fails because, <laughs> because everything hates me. <laughs> 
so what we're supposed to see yeah okay so this is a sneaky backstage part of my demo um, which is visualizing the architecture so we're just going to start that and this i'm also running with quarkus dev because it uses test containers under the covers to start me a database and that kind of thing so i'm going to restart that i'm going to start this and hopefully it will come up a little bit quicker than it did last time and then we can go back to the web reload and let's try ordering a white sweater hooray okay so so what we can see so this is still not actually working but it's failing for the right reasons um, which is that i put in my order and it sends a json payload to the cold person service which is the bff and then what comes back is an exception and the exception if we scroll sort of really far to the right we can see it's got a connection refused exception i don't know if you could see that just right at the right um, that it couldn't get to i think port 8081 so what's going on? Well, this is a microservices application. We have more than one service. So far, I've only started one service. So if I go to the next part of my application, which is that if you want to buy a sweater, someone has to knit the sweater. So let's start Quarkus Dev here as well. And that should start the knitter service. So this is the person who takes the order and knits a sweater. And so that has started and so now we can go here and we can try and order a white sweater again okay so that got further but it still wasn't entirely successful the order went through white payload and then it said went to the knitter and said i want a white sweater but then the knitter the knitter had the same thing it had a connection refused on 8086 what's going on well a knitter can't make a sweater unless they have some wool there's nothing in this service at the moment to give wool. So we can go back to our system and we can start, woo, we can be in the right window and we can start another Quarkus service. So this is the farmer service. So the farmer has sheep. When an order for wool comes in, they go out to the sheep, they shear the sheep, they turn that into wool and they send wool back. So now if we go back here, I can order again. And we finally have a successful flow. So my new sweater is a nice white sweater and we can see the payload goes in and then it comes back and it says, okay, order number three, here's your white sweater. It goes back through the services and gets to the front end. So this is a pretty simple microservices application, only three services. And it was already pretty annoying for me to manually test, even without the, the minor disaster at the beginning. But it gets worse than that. So if I look at my farmer, which is here, I have tests for this. I have unit tests for this because I'm not a maniac. And so I've got tests, for example, that test the, the endpoint. And then if I go in on this endpoint, then I get the right thing back. And the, the, um, I'm using Jackson object mapping. And the thing that I hand back is a skein of wool. So a skein, it's like a, a knitter's term for sort of a, a bundle of, of wool. But if I go and look at that, you can see that here, I've used the British spelling of color, but a lot of my colleagues are American and they might prefer it if I would use a different spelling. So I'm just going to fix that. So if I do a refactor and change that to color, I can do the refactor and Quarkus is continuously rerunning my tests. So my tests have rerun, they're all passing all is good. If I look at my knitter, I can manually rerun the tests. All my unit tests are passing. 
successful refactor thanks to the magic of IDEs. The only problem is if I go to my application and I try and order a white sweater, my sweater is not white. My sweater is not any color at all. And so I can trace through what's happened here. So the payload went through the white sweater, white sweater, then the farmer sent it back, white, but you can see there's that typo. And I mean, this is a pretty subtle kind of typo, even though I know what the mistake is because I just did it deliberately. I still sometimes don't always spot that there was a problem. And this is the kind of thing that happens all the time in teams that someone will want to do a refactoring, which is good and refactoring should be encouraged, but it's really hard to tell what what is safe to change and what's what's not okay to change. And you can have, so you, could, you could have had more unit tests that would have locked this down. So at the moment, although there's unit tests, because I'm using the object mapping, the refactoring just adjusts the expectation. And you could say, no, 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 I'm going to hard code every string. But that's not really helping because it, I still don't know if I do a refactoring, what hard coded strings are okay to change and what hard coded strings aren't okay to change. And, and I don't know what's important to my consumers and what's not important to my consumers. So any, um, any questions so far? Um, no, we don't have any questions. I think people were really happy that the demo was up and working. So I, I think, <laughs> no, 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 but, but the, I, I think everyone's really loving the flow and the questions will come. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, so okay. this is where contract testing comes in. Um, so with a normal mock, there's no, there's no connection to the actual implementation. I have no way of knowing that what I encoded in my mock bears any resemblance to what's actually on the other side. And what contract tests do is they give you that connection. So for the consumer, the contract test acts as a mock. And for the provider, the contract test acts as a functional test. So we can make sure that what's in the mock is actually what got implemented. And so then you end up in that happy situation where if the tests worked, then you can be pretty confident that reality is going to work as well. And so then if they change their implementation and don't do what we all thought they were going to do, then their tests break, which is good because reality would be broken as well. And similarly, if I start coding against a different API for some reason, then my tests are going to break. So I'm going to get each side is getting that fast feedback without having to do end to end tests, which are, they have their place, but they're the opposite of fast feedback. And when we, when we think about the test pyramid, it's sort of useful to sort of put this in a bit of, of context. So at the top of the test pyramid are end to end tests. They, they give you a lot of confidence but they're really expensive to write and annoying to run. So you don't want too many of them. At the bottom of the test pyramid are unit tests. They're so nice to write and they're so fast to run. So you should probably have a lot of them, but the only problem is they don't necessarily give you that much confidence. I think we've all seen projects where the unit tests are all green and it just doesn't work. And so sometimes at the middle, we talk in the middle, we talk about integration tests, but I think it's also useful at, in the middle to think about contract tests, um, not because contract tests are a replacement for integration tests. We had a bit of conversation on, on Twitter before this live stream of, about that. So you do want your integration tests, but I think now integration tests are sort of the frameworks like Quark is making and test containers make integration tests so easy that they're kind of almost getting absorbed into the unit test layer. But then you want something else on top of that that gives you more of the characteristics of the end to end tests. And that's where things like Pact come in. So let me show you how Pact could catch my, my broken application. So I've got my, my sad application. 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with the consumer. And so PACT is an example of what's called consumer driven contract testing. So the idea is that it's a bit like TDD, except between teams, the, the expectations come from the consumer. So if I go to my knitter, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the Quarkus Pact extension. So Pact is, it's been around, I think probably for maybe even 10 years, it's been around for a while. Um, and it's kind of the, the de facto standard for consumer driven contract testing. And Quarkus has integrations with most popular libraries and that includes Pact. And the reason Quarkus has integrations with the libraries is so that we can work, make sure that the library works with live reload, make sure the library works with continuous testing. And also if you're compiling your Quarkus application to a native binary, make sure that the, the library works when compiled to a native binary, because often you need to do a little bit of advanced declaration or that kind of thing to make things work in native mode. And so Quarkus just has the integrations and it takes care of it. Um, so with one of the things that I've been doing since I joined the Quarkus team is working on an integration with Pact so that you can get, so it used to be that you could run Pact tests with Quarkus, but they didn't work with live reload and they didn't work with continuous testing, which is a shame. So now they work with continuous testing. So if I add my extension, so if I do Quarkus ext add Quarkus Pact consumer, that will add the extension. And then what I can do is I can go to my sweater resource. Uh, and if I look at the tests for my sweater resource, you can see I do have tests for the sweater resource. Um, and they follow basically the same flow as you would expect a test to follow. So we inject a mock and that mock is a REST client. Um, and then we do some setup to describe the behavior of the mock. And then we have the actual test, which is basically saying, if I do a sweater order and I have a mock for the, the services provided by the farmer, then I really want a white sweater back. So if I go back to my sweater resource, I'm gonna add a new test here. So I'm gonna create a new test and I'm going to call it the sweater resource contract test. And then what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to copy all of this test because a, a, a contract test on the consumer side should look a lot like a normal test. All that's different with the contract testing is that the mechanism for getting your mock is different, but the basic flow of set up the mock, set the ex set up the expectation or the behaviors for the mock, and then actually test your code is the same. And this is something that I think actually is easy to get wrong with contract testing. And even a lot of the examples on the internet of contract testing get this wrong because you're so focused on the fact that I'm trying to test the farmer and I'm making a contract for the farmer that you end up making assertions about the mock. But of course, the number one rule of mocking is don't test the mock. You're trying to test your code. And that's still true if you're doing contract testing. So here I will just pop all that in and then let's fix the name. So let's fix the name to sweater resource contract test. And now what I'm going to do is because this is a contract test, the thing that's the really different is how I set up my mock. So let's just um, bring up. So this is my continuous testing running. So I'm going to get rid of that. And I should see my continuous testing fail because <laughs> now I have a test that doesn't actually work. I'm making assertions, but I don't have a mock. And instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put in my consumer. So um, I'm going to put in my pack, whoops, my packed. Um, and let's import that. 
And so this, you, you can see this actually looks somewhat similar to what I was doing with my Makido mock. I'm saying that I've got a different annotation at the top, but apart from that, I'm saying if I send you a request body that has some string for color and some number for the order number, then I really want you to give me back a body that says, that looks like this JSON. And then I, I define all in a builder. And then the one bit that's different is I also say two packed, and that's actually writing it down to a JSON file. And we'll see how that works in a moment. And then the actual bit with the assertions is exactly the same. I'm saying if I go to my sweater resource and I hit it on its endpoint and I ask for a white sweater, then I want a white sweater back. So I expect a white sweater. And then the last little bit that I'll add at the top is packed has some JUnit extensions. So we say extend with the packed consumer extension and then, then everything else should work. Um, so now if I, yay. So my, my tests have rerun. You can see it went from red to green because I now have a functional test. And pretty much all of this as well, like if you weren't using Quarkus, it would be pretty much the same, except obviously you wouldn't have things like the Quarkus test annotation. So if I look in my target folder now, you can see that a new folder has appeared called Pacts, and in it is this file called Knitter Farmer JSON. And so this is saying this is a contract between the knitter, the consumer, what I'm looking at now, and the farmer. And here's a description of the interactions that you would have and, and what comes back. So this is, it's not a million miles from something like an open API spec, except that it's probably harder for a human to read and it has a much richer information in it. So now that I have my contract, I can share it to the provider so that the provider can use it to validate their side. Because if I only have it on the consumer side, then I've made myself a mock. I'm already having some benefits in the same way as I would with a Makito mock, but I'm losing the real value of the contract testing. So I've got, there's a couple of ways that you can do this. Uh, the company behind Pact, uh, Pact Flow, they have a managed service, which has a Pact broker. So you can, and then as well, you can run the Pact broker locally. So you could have a Pact broker and you, when your consumer runs its tests, it sends the contract up to the Pact broker. When the provider wants to run its tests, it pulls them down from the Pact broker. That's quite convenient. And it, it has some extra things as well. So you can sort of look at your versions and see if you're safe to deploy, which is the whole reason we're doing this. But I don't want another moving part in this demo. So what, and sometimes teams just don't want a broker. So what they'll do is that the consumer will check the contracts into the provider's source control so that the CI can run them. Um, I also don't want the moving part, moving parts of the CI. So I'm just gonna do it really low tech and I'm just gonna do, um, I've written a little shell script and what that shell script does basically is copy the pact from my folder to the farmer. So now if I go over to my farmer, you can see that so far the farmer is happy. Its tests are running. It doesn't know that it's broken, but if I go to the wool resource test and I make, or sorry, if I go to the wool resource and if I make a new test, and let's call that the wool resource contract test. And then what I'm going to do here for the, for the provider, the packed tests are really easy. They're just a template that says packed. Here's where you can find my service. Please run what's in the contract and validate. I do what's in the contract. So whereas for the consumer, the the consumer does need to put some thought into their tests. So I'm just going to put in that template and you can see it really is quite easy. So I'm just saying, here's where my pacts, pacts live. I am the farmer. I'm not some other provider because there's always two parties to a contract. Um, and here's where you can find my server. This is the port that's just getting pulled in from the Quarkus configuration. And then on the before, we just tell Pact where to find the server. 
Um, and then the test template is just saying, packed, please sort it out. So you'll notice this is failing terribly. Um, and the reason is because I didn't actually add the extension. So I can add Quarkus ext add packed provider that brings in the provider extension. And then if I go back here, normally you could, I probably could add an extension while continuing to, um, to have the continuous testing and the live reload because the packed extension is doing some things with the class loading, it, it needs to be restarted. So now the good news is it's failing for the right reasons, which is it's picked up that problem, which is you've changed the spelling of color. That's not okay. And so I can go back to my skein and I can fix this. So I can change the spelling there. I can do the refactor. And if I go back to my terminal, my tests are passing. So this is quite a lot of work to end up with exactly the same application that I started with, but it shows that PACT can detect these kinds of problems. And so far, all of this, I think you could do it with OpenAPI as well, um, because I've just been looking at basically the schema and saying, was there a typo in the schema? But you can do a lot more with PACT. You can really get more into functional tests. And, and they say that you shouldn't use PACT for functional tests, which is true, but you can certainly get something that's a lot deeper than just an open API validation. And let's, let's have a look at that. So if I go back to my application, uh, if I order a white sweater, we should see that that now works. Yep, I get a white sweater back. And this works for all sorts of colors. So if I order a black sweater, I get a black sweater. If I order a gray sweater, I get a gray sweater. If I want to have a brown sweater, I can order a brown sweater. And you can see each time I get back the right sweater. Um, but of course, Barbie has just come out. What if I want to be a little bit more Barbie core in my sweater. So let's have a pink sweater. So ta-da, the flow goes through with no errors. We send pink into the farmer and then the farmer sends back white. And then that goes through. And then when I get back is a white sweater. So what this is showing is that I have probably a little bit of an architectural problem, which is the way my business model and my flow works is that the farmer just goes out and finds a sheep in the requested color and sends it back. If the farmer can't find a sheep in the requested color, the farmer finds a white sheep and sends the white sheep back. So we've got a fallback, but the knitter wasn't expecting that fallback. And so probably in my sweater shop architecture, I need another service, which is dyeing the wool. So if we can't find the right sheep, we have to dye the wool. And this is this kind of problem. It's not, it's not the fault of any one service. Each service is doing the right thing. They're doing the best they can. But when the whole system comes together, it means that we've got this, this case where things don't work. And this is something probably with open API, you would struggle to, to capture this kind of nuance, but we can do it with packed. So if I go back to my contract. In my contract, when I set up the expectations, I said, I'm going to send you a string. I'm not going to specify what the string was. It doesn't really matter. I'm just going to send you a string, but I can be more specific. So I can say, I'm going to send you not just something of type string. I'm going to send you a specific value, which is pink. And then I can say, when I send you pink, I expect you to send me back pink. So I can change pink to pink here. Let's be looking at my tests as I do this. So you can see now my tests have started to fail uh, because, oh yeah, they're, they're failing with a 500. Um, so I haven't actually adjusted my tests. So instead of doing it for a white sweater, let's do it for pink sweater. 
So let's make a sweater order for pink. And I'm saying I'm going to order a pink sweater and I expect to get back. Uh, have we got the right failure yet? Yeah, so it's saying that I, I had not updated all of my tests. Now that I update all my tests, I should have a passing test, which is from the consumer side, there is no problem at all. If I, I as a consumer, I expect that if I go to the farmer and ask for pink wool, I'm gonna get pink wool back and then I can make a pink sweater, everything works. But if I go to the farmer side, so if I publish that contract, And then if I go to the farmer side, we're going to see a problem. So if a test changes, it will rerun the tests. Um, at the moment, it won't detect that the contract file changed. But if I rerun that, I can see that I've got a failure, which is if, if the farmer is asked for pink, they return white. So at this point, we probably, this is one of the things that I think contract testing is really good for, is just prompting that conversation between the teams to say, hey, is it reasonable for you to expect me to give you pink wool? How are we going to handle this if, if I can't give you pink wool? And there's, there's no right answer about what the, the right behavior was. But I think what's happened in this case is the farmer was trying to do the right thing and they had a fallback. But from the perspective of the knitter, the fallback was not the right thing. So what we can do now is we can now start to put in some more complex expectations as well. And I should say as well that like here, because I was lazy, I just changed my test for, from white to pink. In a realistic scenario, you, you would have a test for white and you would have a test for pink. So Mala, um, any, any questions at this point? A um, lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you would like to answer? So let me pick up one or two and then okay, probably yep. we can. Okay. So, uh, of course there have been good comments, also great presentation so far. And you want mentioned all is pretty clear. So this was when we were, uh, you were and you kind of uh, did well with your uh, uh, live fixing. And um, I asked a question, what are the challenges that you are facing with your microservices? And Simon mentioned that at times people still use link infra under the hood. So would you like to comment on that one? I missed the important word there. Sorry. People still use what under the hood? Linked infrastructure under the hood. I asked, uh, oh, what are yeah. the challenges that people are facing with testing their microservices? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a really hard balance, um, between mm -hmm. trying to get these efficiencies that come from reuse and trying to have something that's really decoupled. And we see that at the code level. And we see that also at the infrastructure level and yeah. So unfortunately, like I, I honestly don't have a good answer, but I think, I think a lot of it is just about challenging some of the assumptions that we had. So, so all of us as software engineers, you know, we're taught at the code level, don't repeat yourself, don't repeat yourself, consolidate everything. <laughs> And with microservices, we have to step back from that and say, actually, there are some downsides to having these shared libraries. They, they introduce a coupling that we don't necessarily want. But on the other hand, if we just copy and paste the contents of the libraries, we maybe still have the coupling. It's just that it's a hidden coupling. And so, and I think it's a little bit similar with, with the infrastructure, which is and I think there's a couple of kinds of infrastructure as well. So one is things like the other parts of your application. So things like the databases. And so that's, that's sort of a, a classic thing that we all had to learn when we were moving to microservices was if your right. business logic layer has all of these beautiful microservices, and then you've got a monolithic integration layer, and then you've got a monolithic mm -hmm. database, this isn't right. But then 
the DBAs go, wait a minute, <laughs> we, we weren't sure that we were signed up for, for managing all of these databases. And then it's similar mm -hmm. as well for things like CI, that it's really convenient and there's an economy in having a centralized CI. And so then when you want to try and spread that out and say, now we have to manage 200 CIs, our platform costs are, are going to go up. Um, and so then you start to look at things like platform teams that are maybe trying to give you some of those economies without giving you the coupling that comes from really tightly linked infrastructure. I don't know if any of that answered the question. Um, I, I think it does. As you said, it, it's complicated. It does kind of one answer. There are a lot of scenarios that we're talking about. So this question that I would like to ask, and then I'll probably let you move forward with your presentation. So Moritz mentioned that I think PACT also has the possibility to use open API specs. Are there any disadvantages using open API specs instead of PACT default specification? Yeah, that, that is a super question. Um, and and I've got mm -hmm. some slides on this later on that we, we may or may not um, get to. But mm -hmm. in general, there's sort of two styles of contract testing. There's consumer-driven contract testing, which is mm -hmm. packed as an example of that. And then there's provider-driven contract testing, which for that, you're going to have open API as your contract language. And then there's various tools that you can use mm -hmm. for that. So there's... Um, there's a, a new tool called Microx that works with OpenAPI and also works with other other things if you're not doing synchronous REST, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. Or um, there's things like you could use sort of Prism and Schema thesis. There's various tools, but one of one of the attractions of provider-driven contract testing is that when you're looking at PACT contract testing, you have to you have to learn PACT, and then you're generating all of these contracts and you look at these contracts that you've generated and you go, wait a minute, I already had an open API specification. Why am I redoing work in order to get something that's like the open API specification I already had? Couldn't we consolidate okay. these? And that is a totally reasonable question. And so there's a few, um, if you're, if you're looking at the sort of the paid for version of, uh, pact now they have, they, I think they call it bi-directional contract testing. And again, it's getting a little bit of a round tripping between your contract and your open API specification. The, there's a couple of disadvantages of doing that, um, which may not outweigh the advantages of the reuse, but it's just something to be aware of. One is you cannot get as much richness into an open API specification as you could into a packed contract. So for example, the pink sweaters, I don't think you could have an open API spec that would say, here's, here's the sweater colors or here's the wool colors that would come back. You definitely couldn't get one that had the next level of richness, which is to say, well, you know, pink sheep, we only get pink sheep in the winter. <laughs> in the summer, <laughs> they bleach out to white. So you, then you can start to get, you know, these really kind of advanced. So in PACT, the idea is it's called state. And so you can, mm -hmm. and again, it's like a given in a test that you say, if you're in this state, this is the behavior I expect. If you're in this state, this is the behavior I expect. And so you can start to use it for things like error handling, or you can also start to do use much richer functional tests. And that means that you get a, a better understanding between the two sides. That's more than just the kind mm -hmm. of the, is the syntax correct? You're actually looking at, is the semantics correct? So that's, that's the first disadvantage. Uh, the second disadvantage, I think, is really about one of the, one of the benefits of the consumer driven contract tests is, is that it gives it, it can be quite useful. Like I mentioned, it's quite nice for a sort of, it's like TDD. So you, in TDD, you would implement to the test and with consumer driven contract tests, you can implement to the contract. So as a provider team, instead of saying, okay, I think my consumers are going to need these eight functions. So I'm going to implement them all. And then I'm going to write my open API spec and publish my open API spec to the world. Instead, the con the consumer can go, you know what? Those eight functions might be nice in the future, but at the moment, the only thing we're using is these two functions. So could you just give us those two? And that means that you it you can sort of do a Yagni development. You know, you ain't gonna need it and only do what's right. actually needed now. 
And it's also really useful for deprecation as well. So I have an acronym for this, which I'm never, I have it on a slide, but I'm never going to manage to do it without the slide because it's something like you didn't need it, but you didn't know you needed it until something. In any case, it's, it's about 18 characters, the, the <laughs> acronym. And really, it's, so it's for deprecation because normally if I make an API and I put something on the API and I share it out to the world, it's really hard mm -hmm. to get rid of it. Maybe on a major version, I might deprecate it, but I can't just, you know, on a micro version go, ha ha, I'm getting rid of this. Mm -hmm. If, if you have good contracts, it, it gives you a lot more knowledge to make those decisions because you can say, well, I put this in my, my API. I have the contracts from all of my consumers. None of them are using this thing. It's annoying to maintain. I can get rid of it. So that's really useful. And it also is quite useful for interversion compatibility. And I think you probably could do this with OpenAPI, but it's really nice with Pact to say, mm -hmm. as a consumer, I, I can't work with version three of my provider because it doesn't have this API that I need, but version four is okay. And the, the original vision for microservices really was that you would have multiple versions coexisting and the the consumer driven contract tests can give you that confidence to know, okay, we can have multiple versions coexisting, but I definitely need to talk to version three and two of the service, but not version four, because they removed a method that I care about, or, you know, just that, that kind of understanding of the dynamics of the system. Right. Um, I think Moritz is happy with the answer. We have a lot of questions, but I will let you move forward with your presentation and I'll hold them to the end of the session. Okay, so I've got I've got one last little thing to show, um, which is, let's say we have the, the 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 farmer and the knitter have the conversation, and they say, "I thought I was doing the right thing by doing the fallback. I see now that wasn't actually helpful. So instead, we're going to do an error flow instead. And what I've done is on my consumer." I've done an exception mapper. So my exception mapper says, um, if I get a not found exception, which is a 404, I'm going to turn that into a 418. And the reason I 418 is I am a teapot. The reason I chose 418 is just to be different from the normal error codes that are going through. And so then I can go back to my test and I can say, my expectation is that I'm going to get a 418 back from my sweater resource. So let's get rid of that and let's get rid of that. And then let's put the semicolon in there and then let's change that to a validatable response. So now I have a unit test which says, okay, I expect that if I ask for a pink sweater, I throw a 418. And as you would expect, because I haven't done anything to support this, it's failing because my contract says, hey, if I ask for pink wool, I get pink wool. So let's update the contract to, to say, okay, actually, no, I'm not gonna get pink wool. Um, I expect that if I ask, so here I'm doing my contract. So it's my expectations for the farmer. And I say, if the farmer gets asked for pink wool, the farmer's gonna send back a 404. And then let's comment out those two. And then what we should have is, we still have a failure. Um, and the failure, what this is showing now is that as a consumer, I haven't properly implemented the support that says if I get a 404, I turn that into a, um, a four, well, I turn that into a not found exception. So what I need to do here is I need to put a bit of try catch in. So if I go here and I do, no, 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 what's this? I do, I want to wrap it in a try catch and there's a really nice shortcut for that, which I just started practicing, but which I haven't memorized successfully. So we'll do it the old fashioned way. 
and I'll do catch exception E and then I'm going to throw a not found exception. And oops. So if we do that, then we should find that my tests are passing. So I've done my error handling now. And now as a consumer, I'm able to handle the case where it doesn't, um, it doesn't have the, the sheep. So now what I can do is I can publish the contracts again. So if I publish my contracts and then if I go to my here and if I really run my tests then you can see again we've shown that problem which is that the farmer hasn't implemented the fallback so now the farmer can say in my wool resource you can see here's my fallback where I catch the illegal argument exception if I try and find a pink sheep and I'd implemented it as return a white sheep and instead I can just say return null and then what we should see is that this is still failing. And the reason it's still failing is because the consumer had said, I want a 404. And here I thought I was doing the good error handling. I thought I was catching the exception and returning null. But actually, if you return null, Jack's RS will turn that into a 204, not a 404. And that is something that I never knew until I wrote this demo. And so actually the farmer still hasn't done it correctly. And the farmer needs to do an extra step to, to do the, the mapping to say, okay, actually, no, I'm going to return a 404 in this situation. And that's the kind of subtle problem that actually would, would be quite hard to catch without the contract tests. Um, so with that, I'm not going to, I'm not going to fix it. Um, I will, I will stop there and I'll just go back to finish the last few slides, which I think will probably cover some of the questions. Um, so <laughs> if you remember one thing from the demo, it's don't test the mock. So the consumer test, it's so easy to think that because we're going to share the contract, the point of the consumer test is to test the provider. The point of the consumer test is to test your code. The contract is a side effect that ensures the integrity of the system, but the consumer test is for testing your code. So don't test the mark. Don't test the mark. And we had a, um, a little bit of a question about this already as well, that the pact is an example of consumer driven contract testing. So you start with a consumer, you generate the contract and then it gets shared to the provider. Um, it's got a lot of advantages. So you get this sort of richer semantic testing. The provider can develop to the, to the contract. It has the annoying thing that you have all of this open API assets that you can't reuse. And also the provider needs to know who the consumers are. So like if you're Stripe, for your external facing API, you're not going to do consumer driven contract testing because you have way too many consumers. So it's good for within a team. But the other thing is that because the consumer shares the contracts to the provider, and then those contracts can cause the provider tests to fail. If you have an antagonistic relationship between your teams, contract testing is going to make this worse. I mean, if you have an antagonistic relationship between your teams, you probably should work on sorting that out anyway. But consumer test driven contract tests do kind of need a, a good relationship. Um, and with that, I think we are sort of at the, at the top of the hour almost. So I guess maybe we've got time for, for one more question. Um, so Holy, do you want me to ask uh, questions now? Or do you want to complete your presentation? Sorry, I didn't. Um, I'm, I'm happy. I think we've covered all of the important bits. Um, so I've got a few more slides, okay. but they're not important. So I think um, let's focus on the questions.
Okay, so uh, the next question is by Yu Wei's interesting name. And uh, the question is, what are your thoughts on minimal structure contract testing? That is, some services are not as flexible as the new services. Uh, for example, a service versus a GraphQL one. Ooh, um, yeah, that that is a good question. And to be honest, it's not something that I thought very deeply about. I mean, it's a it's a really good question, though. Um, and it, yeah, if you um if you ask me on on Twitter or or Mastodon or or something like that, um, yeah, I'll go away and have a think about that. Okay, no, no worries. So next question is about Joe. From uh, I hope I'm uh, pronouncing the name right. So. The comment is great presentation, and the question is about how could uh, the person use that for contract testing for services using the messaging systems, uh, like for example, Rabbit MQ and others. Yeah, that that's something that I think the the Pact team get asked a lot. And when when Pact mm -hmm. was written, it was really written for restful communication. That is not the only way we do communication. And so what Pact, they started to add support for asynchronous APIs and messaging. And then I think they thought about it and realized that this really wasn't gonna scale just for their team. So what they've done mm -hmm. now is they've made Pact um, pluggable. So it's in the some of the more recent versions, there's a plugin framework. And so there's plugins starting to appear for things like messaging. So um, mm -hmm. if you're doing messaging, I think I haven't tried it myself. Um, and one of the things on my to-do list is to add the tests for the Quarkus Pact extension to, mm -hmm. to be exercising it. Um, but there is mm -hmm. the support available in Pact. Another another option, if you're if you're mostly doing that kind of communication, is I mentioned Microx earlier. Um, Microx is provider-driven contract testing, which may or may not be what works for your team. But they have really first class support for a lot of different protocols, I think, because they were able to build on on the experience of Pact and say, wait a minute, just doing RESTful isn't isn't enough. So that's a good place mm -hmm. to look if you have a lot of protocols. And they've so got the good GraphQL way. support as well. Sorry, Mala. Uh, no, no worries. Next question is by Marit. Marit, you could have DM'd Holy. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> And the question is, does adding more contract Im uh, impact build time? She's used a different contract testing framework and replacing all contract tests with isolated tests shape minutes of the build. Yeah, that it's it's a good question. I think it, it's going to depend a little bit as well on on what the framework is. So some some frameworks will stand up the the server for the mocks as a separate process and so for example with microx it stands up the server as a separate process but it it's kind of completely independent of your system so it it you're you're leveraging your kubernetes infrastructure so it's kind of parallelized with pact mm -hmm. the mock is stood up in process my intuition is that because it's stood up in process it's pretty fast but of course you are still standing something up and that that is going to take time and so I think mm -hmm. a bit like anything else right there's probably you you want your contract tests because they're valuable but you don't want your contract tests to proliferate so much that they're slowing down the bill because it is going to be it's it's way lighter than an end-to-end -end test but it is going to be heavier than mm -hmm. a pure unit test so again it's about mm -hmm. it's about looking at the value both in terms of time, but also in terms of coupling. So if you're doing that kind of richer semantic testing, you're getting a little bit close to functional testing. And then there's sort of a temptation to go, oh, and we can do all of our functional testing from the consumer side, and let's test this error case and this error case, and let's test this input. And at some point you have to stop and say, well, wait a minute, no, I, as a consumer, I don't really care exactly what triggers the error condition. I just want to know if it's a 204 or a 404 that comes back. That, that makes sense. Then uh, the next question is from B131R. Forget it. <laughs> so the question is, would you recommend Pact to test the contract between front end and back end? Yeah, it's, 
this is the the second demo app that I, I've done for Pact, and my first demo mm -hmm. app did exactly that. Uh, mm -hmm. When I started to write the demo app, I was going to have 18 microservices, and then eventually I thought, you know what? <laughs> it's really annoying to stand all these microservices up. I'm going to do the world's simplest microservice application and just have a front end and a back end. But it worked mm -hmm. really well because you get the exact same kind of communication problems between a front end and a back end as you do between different services. You get the exact same thing where... A message is coming through and on the BFF, we, we just changed our mind about the, the con, you know, the syntax and we, we did a typo. So it catches all of those problems and it's, it's really good for that. And I think a bit like anything else, it's going to be useful if you have a BFF and the BFF is written by the same team that does the front end. If you have a dedicated front end team and a dedicated back end team, then those people have to talk to each other and they're going to get it wrong sometimes. So then contract tests are really useful. And the next question is by Simone. And the question is, can the provider or the producer provide that contract instead of the consumer? I imagine, for example, a scenario with multiple consumers with different expectations. Yeah, so so I think there's actually sort of two separate parts to that. One, one part is... Yes. If you have multiple consumers, what should you do? And and that um, that is handled quite nicely. So the idea is that um, you just you have a test template for each consumer. So I think I'm not sure if my screen share is still in the. Um, uh, I just added it to the stream now. Yeah. So oh, it's okay, yeah, on the stream. Okay. Um, so I've got it here. Um, so here I'm saying I am a farmer and my pacts live in the pacts folder. And what pact will do is it will look at every single contract in the pacts folder that has a provider of farmer. So I could have farmer okay. and knitter. I could have farmer and milk buyer. I could have farmer and cheese maker. And each one of those would be validated. So if the mm -hmm. expectations are completely contradictory, then the tests will fail. But actually, if the expectations are completely contradictory, the implementation is going to fail anyway, at least for someone. So you can you can layer your contracts. But I think that still sort of leaves the question of, oh, well, can the provider write the contracts? And the purest answer is no, they should come from the consumer. Realistically, at the early mm -hmm. stage, you may not have a consumer. And that doesn't mean that you don't want to bootstrap. So I think it can work really well to have the provider write the contracts and it's again it's a little bit like tdd so i think what you would want to do is you'd want to well if you if you are into tdd you could do it that you write the contract first and then you write your implementation if if you find that an unnatural way of working you could do the same flow as you might otherwise where you write your implementation and then you use contract tests to validate it and then you can share your contracts to the consumer um, in my examples, I used a Java DSL to generate the contracts. You can also just work with the contracts directly. Um, so in the case where the provider provides the contracts, you could just then use as, that as the input to your test and have it define the mock without the consumer having the trouble of defining the mock. I have to unmute myself. <laughs> happens all the time. <laughs> I'm, I'm then asking the questions as you uh, move forward with your presentation, uh, but we're already out of time. So if, uh, I don't know how, how much time. Um, no, I, I think, okay. I think now's a okay. good time to stop. Um, I think, yeah, okay. the, I think most of the rest of the slides were just reiterating what we've already discussed in, in the questions. So I think, I think we should, um, okay. Uh, this is a good point to end. In, in that case, first of all, I would like to share that I enjoyed the presentation. It was amazing. I, I was hooked onto the presentation and it was amazing. I, I definitely learned a lot. So thank you so much for presenting oh, with I'm, us. I'm so sorry, Mala, actually. Having said I don't have anything else in the slides, I do have one more slide that I want to show. I'm sorry. No, no worries. I just added it to the stream now. Yeah. Cool. Um, so ah, the you may sheet. say <laughs> <laughs> that this is not a realistic demo, um, but every, uh, everything that I've seen here, um, like the mm -hmm. 204, 404 is a real problem and the typo is a real problem. And even the pink sheep, um, although in general you don't get pink sheep, um, there's a festival in the UK 
at like a music festival and one of the things they also mm. do with the music festival is they um color the the fields on the surrounding sorry they color the sheep on the surrounding fields so pink sheep are a thing this is a realistic demo and and with that i think we can stop okay so i've taken your presentation so um a lot of interesting comments um Oh, where are they? Yes. Great presentation. And uh, oh my God, where are those? Okay, so thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing presentation. Thank you, Holy. Great presentation. So thank you so much. It, it was an amazing presentation. And I want to thank everyone who is watching, listening. And before we close the stream, any closing comments if you have? None for me. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks to everyone who's watching and um, the one who asked questions so much. We really appreciate that. And uh, I want to thank everyone from the team as well. A big thanks to everyone at JetBrains, especially to Yuri, Sergey, Dina, Zlata, Anna, Daniel, and everyone else who was involved in kind of uh, helping with this live stream. And everyone who's watching the live stream, do not forget to uh, watch next IntelliJ ID live stream, which is on Thursday, 4th August, where Roni will talk about faster feedback loops using open telemetry. And do not miss to subscribe to our channel. Once again, thanks for joining. And until next time, bye-bye.